just got back a few days ago, like three days ago, from a trip to Utah, to specifically to Salt Lake City. Um, it was a long trip. I was gone for about a week. Uh, we drove a grand total of like 26 or 27 hours. Um, we got diverted up into the mountains because of a, because of a, a highway closure. It was a wild experience. Um, and also, I saw a whole bunch of really, really cool birds on the road. Uh, some of you will have seen my posts about that uh, over on Twitter. Uh, let me show you. I didn't take these pictures because obviously I was, you know, traveling and couldn't. But I want to show you the picture of the birds that I spotted just on the first day of my trip. Let me show you these birds, okay? So I spotted an American kestrel, which is this beautiful a uh, bird, this ferocious little puffball. Um, it was, it looked almost exactly like this and it was perched on a power line and it was all fluffed up and it looked really cute. Um, and so I saw this one first, then I saw a golden eagle. And yes, I am sure that it was a golden eagle specifically because of this pattern right here on its tail feathers. This bird that I saw was unbelievable. It was so big. And the one that I saw is not, was at least by my measure, not even like the biggest, first of all, it's not the biggest eagle I've ever seen, but not even the biggest eagle it was a juvenile in all likelihood. And oh my God, it was, it was, uh, we were in Idaho and in a, let me just try to explain what Idaho is like to you all, at least the portion of Idaho that I went through. So there is a section of Idaho that is basically just endless plains, okay? As far as the eye can see, and we were driving on a very clear day. The first day of our drive was extremely clear once we got through the first mountain pass. And it was, we could see miles, incomprehensible miles to distant mountains on either end of these enormous, enormous plains. And oh my God, it was amazing. And I saw a golden, this golden eagle swooping down over the golden plains of, 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 of just grasses and grains, uh, and swooping down to catch something. It was so amazing. Um, and, uh, I will say that uh, despite being a, a really, really beautiful drive to drive through Idaho, it's very hard to capture in a photograph the experience or even in a video, the experience of driving through just sort of endless plains as far as you can see until you see a, a tiny mountain in the distance sort of uh, uh, making up the horizon. Um, it was really amazing. And on the way back, um, on the way back, it was actually even more incredible because uh, on our way back, we happened to be driving when there was a very light snowstorm happening. So the roads were not too bad, but what we got to see was the sort of golden plains transform into uh, a sea of, of white snow with golden waves popping up through the snow. And this is the type of stuff that I, why is, which is why I encourage people to go touch grass. Because when you witness just how much beauty remains in the world, regardless of all of the bad shit, regardless of all of the crap that we have to deal with all the time, it is, uh, it's, it, it gives you a, a, an, a very spiritually empowering experience. And let me see if I can actually get share a picture of this. Let me see if I have, I believe I was able to capture this in a particularly good uh, picture. And I'll share it with you if I can. Achoo! Oh my goodness. Oh, oh wow, sudden sneeze. Apologies about that, everybody. Um, let me just see if I can get a, an, a, a one of my amazing pictures of this because I did get a couple of pictures, but it's hard to capture um, exactly what it looks like when you're driving through this. Well, that's not a very good one. Damn. It see it was just very hard to capture the the sort of Oh, here we go. 
No, that's that's before the snow came down. I wasn't able to get very good f photos of the act of what I'm talking about from the car, but um, there were portions where uh, all you see is is interchanging pure white and pure gold with once in a while a like scrubby tree just sort of dotted in in between. Um, and it's really incredible. It really is breathtaking to see like like shimmering gold across white. And I mean, this was fresh snow. This was un completely undisturbed for miles and miles and miles. Um, and it was really awesome and breathtaking. And uh, me and my partners were just sort of like sitting warm in our car, uh, watching all of this and discussing politics and 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 whatever else came to mind. Um, it was really awesome. Additionally, on my trip, uh, I went. Uh, we we passed through a uh, a the the Umatilla Pass is what I believe it was called. Um, Umatilla Pass. I believe is what it was called. Um, the Umatilla Pass, which is a mountain pass uh, uh, that we did not intend to go through. Now, there's a couple of reasons. Um, there's a couple of reasons why I tend to avoid mountain passes when I'm traveling, um, especially at this time of year. And the reason for that, uh, in the summer, it's fine. Even in the fall, it can be fine. Um, but... Uh, they get pretty intense. Um, they get pretty intense in the winter. And in fact, I actually filmed some of this and some of you may have seen the short that I posted uh, where I, I show some footage. I'm gonna show it right now just so you guys can get an idea of what it looked like to drive through, but I can't even, the camera cannot capture um, the, you know, exactly how, um, it, it just can't capture exactly how uh, how um, scary and also beautiful, but also scary it is. Let me just show you this real quick so you guys can see what I'm talking about, okay? Here we go. Imps, this is what it looks like to drive through a snowy mountain pass. Uh, the second half of our journey has certainly been interesting. Uh, we have Now, because of the lighting, because of the lighting limitations, what you can't see is that immediately out of view, this goes up into walls of snow, okay? It's just like, because you're on a mountain, so it immediately gets sharper, and it's just snow, snow, snow with with these pine trees firing up out of the walls of snow, okay? you're It's like you're driving in the world's biggest water slide, okay? And it is pitch black. The stars are exploding above you. There is so many stars, you can't even believe it. But it's also quite scary because you're, I mean, we saw like two or three other cars the entire time that we were driving through that mountain pass. Um, there's no street lamps, um, or I should say there are street lamps, but they are very, very few and far between. And they tend to be like, situated where people's driveways are or uh because there are people who live up in mountain passes and of course where like attractions are because a lot of these mountain passes have campsites and things like that but i'm talking like one street light for every mile of road that you're driving or whatever it is wild okay and uh what would happen if you broke down well it's actually interesting on mountain passes the uh the local governance usually has uh like basically like rescue trucks that drive through every you know once in a while so there are people who will drive through there and check for cars that may have broken down and in fact um there are uh there are also these things called snow parks where basically they will clear out a flat area on the side of the road where you can just sort of park your car with your lights on and wait out the snow um it's why it's kind of wild it's a very very weird and it is a unique experience um 
the last time that I got stuck driving through a mountain pass, it was during a storm and it was a terrifying experience. It was very difficult. Um, but I am a very experienced snow driver and we had snow tires specifically for our vehicle. So we made it safely, but it was a very scary experience. Th there was no snow falling this time. So we were much safer this time, but again, um, but again, it's still a very intimidating experience to just drive through a mountain pass in the pitch black of night where, uh, uh, and and despite being incredibly beautiful in a way that this video can't quite communicate, again, it's very intimidating. Um, we had snow, we had studded snow tires at the time, so it was they were pretty strong. Um, is where you're from in Maine very snowy? Yes, uh, I grew up in blizzard country, so yeah. Um, so uh, we got to Utah. We got to, to Utah and um, almost immediately upon arriving in Utah, a massive snowstorm struck the area around, around where we were. So basically everywhere to the north and west of where we were um, got just obliterated with snow. So, I mean, to the degree that when we want the national park that I wanted to go to had an avalanche warning they they were telling people do not come to the park because there is a risk of there is like a serious risk of avalanches don't come and so uh we didn't we didn't go to to the parks that we wanted to go to because the weather just ended up being against us which is part of the reason why there's not a whole lot of footage it made me feel pretty bad i'm not gonna lie i was really excited to get a lot of nature footage and to get outside as much as possible but it just didn't work out that way um, so we just kind of ended up hunkering down, spending time, uh, in the city, uh, trying things. We got to try a lot of new food and we got to spend some time with my partner's family because they live nearby, which was very good. Um, but also, as I mentioned in my YouTube post, Doe got sick. Um, uh, the second day that we were in Utah, Doe got food poisoning. Um, and it really sucked because, uh, basically doe was just sick to its stomach for two days and uh thankfully it's doing fine now it's it was just like you know a small bout of food poisoning but it really sucked like doe was literally it was it was keeled over in pain from the food poisoning for a, a solid 24 hours and then it wasn't feeling good afterwards um and uh no 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 the star wars segment has not been missed no segments have been missed. I'm just talking about my trip right now. Don't, don't do misinformation. Don't do misinformation. Yeah, Doe got sick and it kind of sucked. Um, however, we still had a really good time, but this is the part where uh, I have to talk about Salt Lake City, everybody, okay? Now, this is not my first time being in Salt Lake City. I have been to Salt Lake City three times in my life. Um, uh, my partner Fawn, uh, uh, its family lives in Salt Lake City. And so we go to visit every once in a while. Um, but let me just, let me just talk about Salt Lake City because, um, it's a rough place to be. Okay. Salt Lake City is a, I don't want to be harsh because there are a lot of really wonderful people there. Um, but, uh, oh my God, it is a, it is a uniquely depressing city. Um, and I actually found myself feeling bad, just like sort of passively bad. A lot of the time that I was in Salt Lake city. Um, and <sighs> there's a couple of reasons for this. So let me talk about the first one, the most depressing one. Okay. Um, the first one is that, um, you guys ever heard of the salt lake, the great salt lake? Um, so the great salt lake almost doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah, I know it's kind of hard to believe. And if you weren't from salt lake city, that might be shocking to you. Uh, but it literally almost doesn't exist anymore. It's been, um, for a nut. So it's kind of complicated, but the basic story is that, um, 
one of Utah's biggest uh, agricultural products is alfalfa, okay? So you know, like the sprouts? And the reason why uh, alfalfa is one of Utah's biggest pro uh, agricultural products is because the other largest al agricultural product is cattle. And Utah is a desert state. There's not a lot of water to begin with. Alfalfa takes a lot, a lot of water to water and cows eat a lot of alfalfa. So there is a, basically there has been an, an ecological death spiral around Salt Lake City for a very long time that has severely damaged the water uh, access in the state. Um, yes, I am gonna talk about that Killjoy 40K. Um, Killjoy 40K says, are you gonna talk about the arsenic issue at the bottom of the lake? Yes. Um, when we, one of the museums that we went to while we were in Utah, which I'm gonna talk about as well because that was a, a very good experience. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, one of the exhibits at this museum is a historical, it's a, it's a literal, it's a play exhibit. You get to pump water back into the lake and you get to see what the lake was like uh, even a hundred years ago. Did you know that the deepest point of the Great Salt, Salt Lake at the moment is 16 feet? That's right, the Great Salt Lake, its deepest point now. It used to be in, in 30,000 years ago, it was 900 feet deep. Now it's 16 feet deep, okay? And a lot, and even just a hundred years ago, it was significantly deeper than it used to be. Um, but you can actually stand back if you go up to the high point of the city. If you go and and drive up to the to the mountains around the city, you can see across the city, and you can see this tiny shriveled lake and just endless salt flats around it. But there's something even worse, which is that at the bottom of the lake there is an incredible amount of pollution. Uh, both industrial pollution and just sort of uh, uh, the 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 way that history create for some hist I don't I'm not a geologist but there's both industrial pollution and there is a bunch of naturally occurring arsenic so there's a actual incredibly dangerous situation which is that if the rest of the Great Salt Lake dries up people will actually have to leave Salt Lake City because there will be arsenic dust storms. Not kidding you, that is an actual problem that they, it was plastered all over the museum. They were like, please, we need people to take water conservation seriously because we're going to have arsenic dust storms if the lake dries up anymore. And uh, it was dystopian. Uh, to say the least. It was a little bit sad. Um, especially because so much of the uh, water, uh, like the, the sort of loss of water in the state is explicitly caused, not just by human intervention, but specifically the meat industry. It is really rough. And another thing, that complicates this is that uh, SLC has some of the worst air pollution in the entire world. In fact, last summer, they topped the charts as being the single most polluted air in the entire planet. Uh, in, it was in the, I believe it was in the summer of 2022 that they earned that particular um, uh, uh, award, uh, if you can call it an award. And the reason for this is because Salt Lake City exists in a basin. So you have to think of it like a bowl, okay? Like a big, a giant bowl. Now, I will say when you, when you're, when you are in, like if you get to the top of a, of a hotel or a building or whatever in Salt Lake City, the view is incredible because you are in the bottom of a giant bowl of incredible mountains. The mountains around Salt Lake City are amazing, okay? But you have to understand that the way that the wind patterns work, it means that air circulates around in the basin um, for long periods of time. And one of the things that you'll notice when you go to Salt Lake City is that there is an absolutely enormous industrial district. I mean, like one of the first things that you see driving in uh, from the north side of Salt Lake City uh, is is foundries. I'm talking giant old school foundries with fire shooting out, fire and black smoke shooting out of the top. Uh, no joke, like literally. And 
um, all of that just gets trapped and cycles forever in addition to the normal patterns that are bringing in pollution from elsewhere. So it's a, it's a rough city, um, to be in. Um, and, uh, there's another thing that I, I have to sort of complain about, uh, about Salt Lake City that made it really hard. Okay. Which is, uh, more complicated than I could hope to summarize, but Salt Lake City is a quintessentially American city. Um, and what I mean by that is that it is, it, Salt Lake City was planned from the moment that it was founded. It is a city that is built perfectly on a grid. All of the roads in the city are numbered, uh, like it will literally be 1000 East, 500 East, 500 South, 1000 West. Uh, it's literally g -g 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 and as a result, it feels like you are living in a, uh, in a sterilized wasteland. Um, there is very little, like, room for natural life. Uh, there is, like, of course there are some small parks, but they are very contained. Um, and also business development has been essentially rampant uh, in recent years, specifically condos. Um, like condos and Airbnbs have completely taken over Salt Lake City. Now, this is something, the first time that I went to Salt Lake City was almost, was like, what? Well, let me let me think, it was like five, to, five or six years ago was the first time that I went to Salt Lake City. And even since the first time I went to Salt Lake City, um, you, it's completely like a lot has changed. And what you have is a ton of copy pasted, uh, condominium buildings and also ongoing condominium construction projects. So a lot of the city is just copy pasted structures and then just bl blown out construction sites. And it is, uh, oof, oof. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, BZ says the wealth the wealth divide in Salt Lake City is wild. The rich literally live on the mountainside. Yeah, it is drastic. The class striation in Salt Lake City ha is so visible. It's shocking. It's actually shocking. Um, and, uh, I was just like, oof. It was a lot. Uh, and of course it was, you know, for, for my partner, Fawn, who was, who, who grew up in Salt, in Salt Lake City, it was a pretty sad experience to discover that a bunch of places that it grew up like around have been demolished and replaced with condominiums. I mean it over and over again. Fawn was like, I want to take you to this place. And we went there only to discover that it had been flattened for condominiums, which is a bit depressing. Um, uh, let me talk about a very positive thing um, that happened in uh, Salt Lake City because I've talked about some of the negative things, the things that made me feel a little bad, um, but I wanted to talk about something positive, which is I went to the, uh, the Natural History Museum of Utah and it is a banger of a museum, okay? It is a absolute banger, okay? If you go to Salt Lake City, if you're in Utah, go to the Natural History Museum. It is, I've been to a lot of museums in my life, okay? I've traveled a lot in my life. I've been to a lot of museums. It's one of the best, okay? It is so cool. Um, do they have a Noah's Ark? No, but interestingly, they have the opposite of a Noah's Ark. Uh, one of the most, one of the reasons why people praise the museum, uh, the, the, uh, Utah Natural History Museum in Salt Lake City so much is because they have an entire section of the museum devoted to the history of human evolution, where they have cast skulls that you can compare and it teaches you very explicitly about the history of human evolution. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually quite a bold thing for them to do in a city that is incredibly religious. And when I say that it is incredibly religious, um, there are, 
the the Mormon Church is all it is omnipresent in Salt Lake City. Literally everywhere you go, you will see a Mormon church. You will see the city is full of Mormon, uh, 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 of Mormon posters. The city is full of Mormon billboards. Okay. Let me tell you a, just a real quick side story. Okay. Right here, this right here, what you see before you, this is a vape. Okay. This is a CBD vape. All right. It has, it is, it is so, it, it, it's so watery. There's barely any, uh, there's barely anything in it. Uh, it, it has 0.3% Delta nine. Uh, that's because cannabis is extremely restricted. There is medical cannabis allowed, but it is very restrictive. It's very difficult to get a prescription, uh, in salt in, in Utah and Delta eight THC zero, et cetera, are explicitly banned. Delta nine is probably going to be banned and CBD even is restricted. Um, and despite all of this, the city is peppered with anti-marijuana ads everywhere on bus stops on billboards on the side of buildings everywhere you turn there is anti-marijuana ads it is wild and yes that's another thing killjoy brings up the fact that um uh if you in 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 utah you will discover, first of all, you can only buy alcohol at state liquor stores. You can't buy alcohol in a grocery store or in a gas station like you can in any other state. You have to go to a state-run liquor store. And in Salt Lake, in uh, no, and in Utah, uh, beer is restricted to 4.5%. So the strongest beer you will find, literally to the degree that beer companies have to make unique they have to make unique beers just for Utah. Uh, they're all restricted to 4.5%. It's wild. Um, Killjoy says, in Salt Lake City, it's absolutely crazy how many jobs you will lose out on because you didn't pay 10K to go on a mission trip with the, with the LDS and colonize some third world country. Oh, yes. It is... I could talk about the Mormon influence in SLC all day. It is wild. Um, like it's, it's like, it's the, it's the most re like most concentrated religious place that I've ever been. And keep in mind, I grew up in religious fundamentalism, but I have never seen a place so unbelievably coded in religion as Utah. It is just unbelievable. Um, is Fawn's family Mormon? Uh, a good chunk of Fawn's family are indeed Mormon. Um, Fawn's immediate family are not Mormons. Uh, Fawn is from like the branch of the family that are, that are not Mormons. Uh, but yes, a big chunk of Fawn's family is Mormon. Um, yeah, the train, the, the public transit is pretty, uh, pretty great. Unfortunately, uh, they also have like eight lane roads every single place that you go. And the road system in Salt Lake is completely and utterly uh, just the infrastructure is demolished. They're like, I can't even believe the amount of potholes and destroyed roads that we had to drive across in the middle of a city. It was absurd. Um, wild. Uh, but, but yeah, they do have a good train system. Like the, the, you can get basically anywhere in town really easily on their light rail system. It's absolutely wild. Um, so, uh, uh, anyway, I wanted to talk a little more about the, uh, the museum, the museum of natural history. Um, while I was in the museum, while I was in Utah, we got to go and see an absolutely incredible, uh, traveling exhibit. And this was the history of Angkor. Uh, for those of you who don't know, let me show you a picture. Let me show you what Angkor looks like, okay? Angkor is a Cambodian uh, temple complex from the ancient world that is, f it is unbelievable, okay? Now, uh, I'm talking to the point that, that when uh, when people uh, from beyond Asia 
first traveled to see Angkor, they they came back saying that there was a city more resplendent than Rome that they had just been completely unaware of. The West was totally unaware of the existence of a uh, a religious capital on the in the Far East that was just unbelievable. And so they had a traveling exhibit with with real uh, pieces, like real statues, gigantic statues and carvings, uh, road markers, um, uh, pieces of structures, artifacts that were that were on loan from the Cambodian government. Uh, it was an absolutely incredible uh, uh, exhibit, and I truly, truly loved it. Um, I learned so much about the history of Angkor. I learned so much about the Khmer uh, uh, Empire. Let me tell you something really interesting about Angkor. Angkor was a, a, a basically a temple city that was built um, that was built by <laughs> by divine emperors, and, and it was supposed to be a reflection of the divine realm itself. So the city was built. Uh, according to basically a, a religious vision of heaven, um, which is incredibly unique because there's very few cities that are like that. Um, and, uh, uh, and it was, it was, in, it was amazing. Now, the interesting thing about Angkor is that despite being built by a pretty militant empire, the Khmer Empire was, of course, an empire. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about that. However, uh, religion, many religions were practiced and welcomed in this temple city. Um, so Hinduism and Buddhism were both uh, officially practiced religions in Angkor for uh, thousands of years, but in addition, uh, Islamic uh, and even Christian, eventually, uh, uh, worshippers were allowed to come and worship at the temple and were accepted. In fact, in the, in the actual exhibit, they had a milestone that was written in a, in a, like, early Arabic text because there would be so many Muslims who would make pilgrimage all the way to Angkor because it was a religious, it was simply a, a temple city that welcomed members of basically all religions, which is really incredible uh, and not something that you hear about in history very often. Uh, Angkor was in uh, C Cambodia. Um, I wanted to show you one of the pictures that I, uh, I did post this to the channel, so some of you may have seen this already, um, but regardless, uh, it, was, it was really breathtaking. Um, getting to see like the actual artifacts that were on uh, that were on loan uh, from Cambodia from Cambodian cultural authorities. I want to show you this real quick. This one right here. This was a hand carved uh, uh, milestone. Each of these, there are literally hundreds of these little guys. And these were milestones. There would be many of these placed out showing travelers how they could reach the steps of Angkor. All four sides were coated with these little carvings of, of, uh, of worshipers and saints and kings. Absolutely amazing. But also, there were carvings. This is a real carving that was on loan that we got to see absolutely amazing okay just just incredible what we got to see there and uh, this is a carving of uh this is a uh, a carving of garuda on top of the naga uh so a a a a warrior bird deity uh on riding on top of a enormous snake deity Um, and that was just, it was breathtaking to get to see all of that. And in addition, one of the cool things about the, um, about the, the Angkor display was that, uh, a large chunk of it was explicitly, uh, about the history of, of arche archaeological plunder. Um, it was a serious call out to specifically France, uh, who was, you know, France 
in particular was partic was was very bad about uh, plundering and stealing Cambodian artifacts. But a a large chunk of the exhibit was basically a blanket denouncement of archaeological theft. Um, and also it literally made fun of, of French archaeologists because um, apparently there was a point where uh, where like a French archaeologist discovered Angkor and when and when people who lived in Angkor, uh, whose ancestors had been living there for like thousands of years heard news that Angkor had been discovered. They were like, what do you mean discovered? Like we're living here. What do you mean it's been discovered? Like like discovered by you maybe. Um, and it was uh, <laughs> it was it was really funny because they the, like I don't know it was it was a very the, the exhibit was very good. Um, it was cool because uh, most of the exhibits were done by uh, like there was a virtual uh, a virtual curator uh, for each of the major segments of the exhibit, which was a Cambodian museum curator. So there weren't a whole lot of actual like uh, 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 Utah uh, university curators there. It was all done via like digitally with Cambodian curators, which was very cool. Um, and a nice, it was, it was nice to see a, uh, a, a, uh, a major architectural or not architectural, uh, archeological, um, exhibit that wasn't, uh, super, super, super exploitative. Um, it was very cool. So, yeah. Yeah. So it was a really, really cool exhibit. And, uh, that was one of the best parts of the, uh, of the whole trip. Additionally, uh, the hall, the, the dinosaurs exhibit in the Utah uh, Natural History Museum is breathtaking. It's incredible. And the reason for that is because a large amount of the dinosaurs discovered in America were discovered in Utah. Um, I know that sounds shocking, but Utah is a state where uh, in in the ancient 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 history of the world there was a ton of dinosaurs and there were also a ton of like uh muddy bogs that preserved dinosaur fossils that preserved skeletons so they have a ton of original fossils of a ton of original skeletons that are there on display and they have a lot of them it was really really awesome um we did hear somebody who was very offended uh, in the dinosaur area. And I don't know, we weren't able to hear enough of the conversation that we eavesdropped on unintentionally, um, but they were like, yeah, well, you know, corporations pay the news to tell you whatever the, whatever the hell they want. And they were super mad. Like it was this lady who just had an extremely angry look on her face through the entire dinosaur exhibit, which was very funny, I will say. Uh, and I don't want to judge too far because maybe maybe they weren't actually mad about the dinosaurs. I don't want to jump to super, super conclusions, but it definitely seemed like she was mad about the dinosaurs, um, which was pretty funny. Um, yeah, yeah, so... <sighs> yeah, the dinosaur section was very impressive. Uh, also, the uh, the uh, Utah Natural History Museum also has a really impressive uh, 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 exhibit on specifically Utah Native American history that is very in depth, um, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, like everything from, uh, oh, and there was a really cool exhibit that they talked about where, um, that I particularly liked, which was that, uh, it was, it was a specific little miniature exhibit that was about the illusion of progress. And they were like, lots of people like to think that progress only moves in one direction. And then they talked about how they showed a bunch of, um, a bunch of, sandals and moccasins that were over time from the same tribes and uh basically before western expansion you could see that the mo moccasins were like super super beautiful and intricate and as time went on and as uh like game and resources became more scarce 
you they they had them lined up to so you could see that they went from being like these incredibly beautiful adorned moccasins into just like the most basic survival moccasins you can imagine and that was a again a massive call out uh to the uh the sort of like uh I'll call it the neoliberal uh, myth of like eternal progress uh, that actually uh, sometimes people are forced to go from something wonderful to something less wonderful as a, as a means to survive, which is pretty harsh and pretty severe. But I liked that exhibit because it was uh, it was uh, it was very confrontational and I find confrontational exhibits to be very interesting. Um, anyway, that was basically the entire journey uh, of our trip to uh, to Utah, and we had a very good time there, despite the bumps that we ran into. Uh, I was not able to stream as planned, just for a couple for a number of reasons that I said before. Uh, however, the next trip that I do, I will be uh, doing a road stream, uh, and I've got some some extra tools to make sure that will be possible uh, next time. Um, but, uh, but, uh, anyway, uh, it was, a, it was a good trip despite the weather issues and despite the minor bout of sickness, we had a really good time going there. Uh, so yeah, um, definitely check out that museum, uh, if you go there. Uh, oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, next time I go to Utah, I will be making the I will be making a specific goal to go to Southern Utah and to see the natural the national parks in Southern Utah. Unfortunately, uh, we were not able to make it into Southern Utah uh, based on this particular trip. It would it would have been significantly more driving for us to be able to go that far out of the way, and it just wasn't in the books for this trip. But next time I will be going to uh, Zion and the Arches and all of that um, because I've heard those parks are really incredible, and I would like to see them someday, even if I wasn't able to this trip. And no doubt I'll be going back to Utah in the future because, of course, uh, family of my partner lives there. So... Somniostatic says, so you drove something like 5,000 miles in the last month? Yep. Yep, I did. Uh, I drove a lot in the last 15 days. Um, an absolutely incredible amount. I didn't really mean for it to work out that way. It's just the way that it worked out. Um, yeah, it was a lot of time in the car. Um, but, uh, whew. Uh, to be honest, I'm still a little tired. Like, I'm, I'm pretty exhausted um, and obviously you guys know I've been away from stream more than I usually like to be, but Hey, it was pretty important. Uh, you know, obviously I really was happy to help Zan move up here and obviously you got to see family when it happens. Um, so, uh, yeah, hopefully you can take a car break after this. I sure hope so. I am absolutely, absolutely ready to no longer spend any time in the car for at least the foreseeable future. And I don't think I'm going to have to, so that's good.